This is episode number 41 of Hitting for the Cycle. And as you can see for today's episode, I am not with my typical co-host, Ben Cruz. He is off on vacation in Bermuda. So instead, I have Tom Albano joining me for this episode. And uh, Tom, you have the unfortunate distinction of sitting on the Red Sox side of the podcast today. Well, I decided. Well, I decided to be nice and take that slot because, well, one, Ben is on vacation because so I'm the person that he's re- that I'm replacing, and you know, whoop de doo to him. I hope he's enjoying Bermuda, and part of me just can't help but feel jealous that he's there, and I'm sitting here. But uh, it's a great honor <laughs> to be with you, Ryan. Uh, you know, fellow Yankees fan. So we'll we'll have our gripes with the Yankees. We'll get a little bit of uh, you know opportunity to crap on whatever it is that they're doing although they're still in the battle for first place but you know glad to be here a lot of stuff we're going to get into with the all-star game all-star weekend officially in the books we're in that we're in that point now where well finally the second half of the season is about to start because they were, we've been in that two-day period of no sports and it's it's killing me it's killing you. I, I, I could have been break a little bit. I mean, 162 games I follow. I watch basically a little bit of almost every game as much as I can throughout the course of the season. So it's oh. definitely nice to get just a, a little bit of a breather and not have to worry about the Yankees rising or falling in the standings. For oh, the- no, I'm not saying it's not a relief, but when there's no other sports that are on. I mean, yeah, I guess right. MLS is on, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. But uh, yeah, um, it's the All-Star break is uh, coming to an end. We're recording this on Thursday, uh, July 18th. So um, the All-Star break um, was this week. And uh, of course, that meant the Home Run Derby and the All-Star game took place this week. And we're going to get into the recaps for both of those events. But before we do, we just want to remind everybody to follow Hitting for the Cycle on Facebook, X, and Instagram at HFTCETV. Follow the Empty the Bench podcast network at ETB Network. Follow our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ETB Network. And finally, listen to us on whatever platforms you listen to your podcasts on. And, of course, uh, Hitting for the Cycle and all these other shows here on the Under the Bench Podcast Network is presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETV Network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. All All right, right, so let's... Let's get into it. So let's start off with the Home Run Derby, which took place on uh, Monday. And the Home Run Derby was uh, pretty entertaining. Um, It was a pretty good battle between um, eight participants. The participants for this year's Home Run Derby were Alec Boehm of the Phillies, Bayou Witt Jr. of the Royals, uh, Adolis Garcia of the Rangers. Um, The Home Run Derby, of course, took place in Arlington, so he was the hometown hero. Teoscar Hernandez of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Pete Alonso, two-time Home Run Derby champion of the New York Mets. Jose Ramirez of the Cleveland Guardians, Marcelo Zuna of the Atlanta Braves, and Gunnar Henderson of the Baltimore Orioles. And the winner of this year's Home Run Derby was Teoscar Hernandez, and he made a little history here. It's the first Los Angeles Dodger ever to win the Home Run Derby. And um, it was a battle. It was a very big battle to, to, win, the, uh, to win the award. Um, in the first round of the uh, Home Run Derby, the, uh, the first four um, who hit the most home runs um, advanced to the second round, which would be in a bracket format, um, going back to an old school tradition of how the home run derby went. And I still think should be to this day. I don't like this new format. I think it's a little yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it that reminder of like, that. that's the thing. It was like fun, but it's like, you know, it reminds me of better times when everybody just got 10 outs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, and I think it um, didn't tire the uh, hitter out as as quickly and uh, they were able to hit the ball a little further um, than they do right now. But um, so the first round, the first four to advance were Alec Bohm. He hit 21 home runs. Bobby Wood Jr., who hit 20. Adolis Garcia, who hit 18. And Teoscar Hernandez, who hit 19. My money was actually on um, Jose Ramirez. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, so it was Bohm, who, so it was Bohm, Wood. Ramirez and Hernandez. I'm sorry. I, I said Garcia. It was Ramirez who uh, advanced to the second round. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was on. Ho- Ramirez hit 21. 
my money was actually on Jose Ramirez because he's a veteran hitter and he's done almost everything there is to do in Major League Baseball. So I just felt that when it comes to personal accomplishments, he was due for something like this. And uh, he put on a very good show in the first round. Alec Bohm, you know, he came out of the gates, you know, just slugging away. And I have uh, to give credit to Ben because Ben had said, you know, Alec Bohm, he said he was, it was a quiet pick. And he, he, he to Ben's credit, he had had a phenomenal performance making it to the semifinals. I loved when, uh, I was it Gunnar Henderson was about it. And, and you got to see that camera turned to Alec Bohm. As he clinched his spot yes. for the second round, he's like, just like everybody expected. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I gotta give a, um, yeah. I gotta give props to Gunnar Henderson. He, he has quite the Scooby Doo impression, and his uh, Scooby Doo bat was a, uh, was a uh, pretty sick too. I'm a, I was a big Scooby Doo fan growing up myself, and that was my one of my favorite shows growing up. And uh, I'll give it to him. He certainly can do a, a Scooby Doo impression very good. And uh, eases the pain of the Orioles beating the Yankees in that last game before the All Star game. Almost, I can say something there. And there we go. I said something positive about Gunnar Henderson as a Yankee fan <laughs> so instead of him just kicking. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. Um, I'm probably going to be limited with uh, other nice things to say about him moving forward from this point on. But, um, you know, Henderson, not the best performance in the home run derby. He only hit 11. But, um, I mean, he just went out there. He did as good as he could. He had fun. Um, so, um, and I did, and like I said, I did like the enthusiasm that he brought to the home run derby. It was pretty funny. And, um, in the second round, like I said, second round was bracket format. It was, um, it was Alec Bohm against, uh, Teoscar Hernandez in the, uh, in the second round that was won by Hernandez. He knocked out Bohm. And on the other half, it was a battle of AL central rivals, um, Bobby Witt and Jose Ramirez and Bobby Witt came out on top on that end. And then it was Bobby Wood Jr. and Teoscar Hernandez in the uh, championship round. And Hernandez narrowly defeated Bobby Wood Jr. by a score of 14 home runs to 13 home runs. And the way that it ended was as dramatic as it got, and it looks like we just lost Tom. All right, so while we wait for Tom to get back on here, um, I guess I'll just uh, recap the last part of the uh, home run derby here. So um, I'm reading this from the uh, MLB uh, website. So Witt, um, he hit a total of 13 home runs in the championship round, and the way that he lost it um, was pretty excruciating, honestly. Um, he On his final swing in the bonus round, in the uh, final round of the home run derby, Witt crushed a 406-foot shot to uh, dead center field in um, Arlington, and the ball narrowly, narrowly missed going out of there. It, went, it hit the middle of the wall. And uh, just like that, Hernandez wins the home run derby. So it barely missed tying Hernandez on his last swing of the of the uh, of the evening. But uh, Hernandez, you know, he won the uh, home run derby title, and like I mentioned, he made a little history in the process. He became the first Los Angeles Dodger to um, win the home run derby. And so uh, kudos to him. Um, it was a pretty entertaining home run derby. For the most part, okay, we got Tom back here, so uh, that's good. I basically just um, recapped how the home run derby ended, um, which was how Witt just narrowly came within inches of tying um, Hernandez. Oh, when you talk about inches, you mean the fact that it yes. just hit the wall? Yes, it barely just... hit the wall in the deepest part of the ballpark, basically. I, I was just watching that, and I'm like sitting here like that, like oh my god, like that's got to be the most heartbreaking way to lose the home run derby. It's got to be one of the, if not the most painful way. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Bobby Wood really exceeded my expectations in his performance in this derby. I didn't think he was going to hit as many home runs as he did. But, um, but yeah, he gave Hernandez a run for his money. And, he, and like I said, he just missed, just missed. And it, it may have been one of the closest, end, closest um, ways to end a home run derby, separated by just one home run. But to Oscar Hernandez, the veteran, um, secures his home run derby championship. So uh, congratulations goes to um, Hern goes to Hernandez. And um, I think we can both agree that uh, that was arguably one of the biggest ways to uh, steal the show. However, the home run derby itself was not the biggest talking point of the evening. We have to address the elephant in the room, I believe. And, yeah. Uh, and that was, of course, that anthem. <laughs> that national anthem. Oh, my God, was that bad. 
That was absolutely dreadful. I honestly, to be honest with you, what, so the national anthem prior to the home run derby was sung by this country artist. Um, her name was in, is Ingrid Andrus. I, mm-hmm. I had never heard of this woman before um, the start of this home run derby. Ne- I, I'm not a country music fan, um, so I knew nothing about her. Um, but honestly, when she walked out, on, looking back, when she first walked out onto the field, her hair was kind of frizzy, not necessarily neat. And I'm, and honestly, I was thinking to myself, what did this woman just run a mile or something like that outside in the heat before she came on, onto the field? She looks like she looks a little, she looks fatigued and she just looks, she looks out of it. And then she started to sing. And I think I lasted 10 seconds before I muted my television. And I was like, okay, this is going to be rough. But I, honestly underestimated just how rough it was i only let like i said i only listened to the first 10 seconds of this so once it was over you know i kind of you know put it to put it on the back burner i wasn't really thinking so much about it and then i saw you know all the comments pop, pop popping up on a social media just completely crushing her and her performance and so once the um home run derby eventually ended and i had some time i went and i watched a little more of her home run derby and I home run derby performance and I was getting more and more agitated and more and more annoyed and eventually I I have not watched her performance from start to finish because I can't bring myself to it was that bad this is you didn't watch the whole thing I have not watched the whole thing I can't do oh wow I cannot do this it it was it was dreadful it it was was dreadful dreadful. so I originally so you talked about how she came out and yeah Basically connecting it to her later statement, basically implying that she was intoxicated. Mm-hmm. I did not watch her entrance. I was just sitting here doing work and I was because it was just the anthem. So she didn't I'm really like, have an entrance. She just can't she just came out in front of the microphone for the front oh, of the microphone. Yeah, but I, that's it. But I, still, I, like I'm just thinking in my head, okay, it's just the anthem. So it's like, you know, okay, I'm sitting here. And then at first I'm hearing her the weirdness of the anthem. I and mean, I would say Maybe she's trying and they were trying to do something like, well, you know, I want to talk about bad anthems, making this comparison. Fergie at the NBA uh, All-Star game six, seven years ago. And I'm like, OK, maybe she's trying something eccentric or something. But then it's just going on and on. And I'm like, there's something wrong here. Alec Boehm, the camera showed Alec Boehm and Alec Boehm was barely trying. He couldn't keep a straight face. I'm like, what is this? And I'm like. Am I just hearing things? Am I going crazy? And then like you, I'm looking at social media and just everybody blasting her. I'm like, wow, we just witnessed something dreadful in real time. Now, as far as that statement goes, I mean, brings up uh, several questions here. Number one, how did, you know, number one, why? Number two, how did nobody notice this? And just like, why was she allowed to continue on and go into the performance like that, if that's true? And number three, just, I don't know. Which, by the way, when I heard that she was a Grammy Award winner, I'm like, that makes things even worse. Four-time I mean, Grammy, Grammy nominee, apparently. Grammy nominee. but And then I find out the Grammy nominee was supposed, it was in guitar playing. It wasn't in singing. <laughs> that explains it. Yeah, it was uh, it was not good at all. And like I said, I have not listened from start to finish because I just can't bring myself to do that. I mean, I am no singer myself. I have a horrible singing voice, and even I know that that's very bad when it comes. Yeah. To singing. So um, yeah, like we mentioned, eventually she posted on her social media. Uh, I think the day after um her debacle that she she admitted that she was intoxicated and she is going to be checking herself into an alcohol rehab clinic. Um, and again, I should be making light of the situation, but it brings up the idea of how was this allowed to go on? How did nobody notice this? I don't know. I, I really don't. And, you know, there's always talk about, I mean, seeing the national anthem at a sporting event, is it's an honor. It's a privilege. And it should be taken with a moment of, you know, pride and, you know, get everybody and get the crowd hyped up for the event that's about to take place. Instead, you got, what was it, 40 something thousand people like staring at staring at you and looking at each other like, what the hell is going on around here? It was yeah. it was something it goes down as one of the worst national anthems I personally have ever heard. And um, I mean, it's up there with uh, Ferg- Fergie's uh, performance at the All Star Game all those years ago. It probably, I think, this was honestly worse than um, 
I think this might be might have been worse than Carl Lewis's performance um, all those years ago um, in the oh, 90s. Yeah. That was very bad. But Lewis at least knew what was going on, and he apologized during the national anthem itself. Where, where would you put this when you, you when you're doing your worst sporting event national anthems ever? Where would you put this in comparison to Perky and in comparison to that infamous Rosar, Roseanne, Roseanne Barr? Oh, my God. Okay, I think Roseanne Barr's was the worst national anthem ever because she didn't even try. Like, like she just went up there and she made a complete mockery about it. So, um, well, I was going to say, it kind of went with her character, though. I, I understand. But that was that was just a level of complete idiocy that I don't know has ever been close to being duplicated. Whoever whoever hired Roseanne Barr that night should should have been terminated immediately. There should have been no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So, in my opinion, Roseanne Barr's rendition of the national anthem at that Padres game all those years ago, that's the worst national anthem that's ever been sung in the history of uh, national anthems. Because like I said, she never she didn't even try. She screamed and she didn't take it seriously. So and I'm not and I'm not exaggerating when I said she screamed. She screamed. Oh, Watch the video if you haven't seen it. And I and I'll warn you, it's even worse than what we saw on Monday night. It's not even close, honestly. It's a thousand times worse. So Roseanne yeah. Barr takes the cake for the worst national anthem of all time, in my opinion. This I would put probably I I'm sure there are a lot of bad national anthems that have happened at sporting events throughout the throughout history, but based on from what I've seen. From, from my personal standpoint, I'd say this prob if I were to watch all of these bad national anthems over the course of time, I'd say this probably takes a spot in the top ten, if not top five. Oh, I, this is top five. This, this is, is definitely top. top. This this might be top three. Top three. You put this in the top three along with uh Roseanne and um Fergie. Yeah, definitely. that's the top three. Yep. Yeah, I mean you may I mean I wouldn't I would not fight you over that. Like I said, this was this was bad. This was very, very bad. And um, if that's the case, if she was intoxicated and she is checking herself into rehab, in all in all sincerity, I hope she gets the help she needs. I um, hope so too. Actually, correction, it, correction. I I'd be tempted to say top three, but top five might be more likely because I just remembered there was that I forget what hockey event it was, but there was the. Yes, uh, Canadian anthem sing Canadian anthem singer. She sung the Canadian anthem. She went to sing the American anthem. Screwed up on the words twice. Went back to get the words. Ends up slipping on the mat and falling on the ice, and then just leaves without completing the anthem. Yeah, that was pretty bad. But you know what? She was so embarrassed that um she could she couldn't bring herself to doing that. So I can understand the embarrassment that she felt that night, and I can only imagine how bad she felt honestly after that. That's true um, too. Barr had no remorse for her performance. No. She spat after she finished and then like runs towards the side of the dugout with her arms spread out and her head up, like saying like <laughs> boomy basically. Yeah. Like, so she was taunting the crowd almost. So like so, like it's because, it's because of that, that and the way, way that, that she's saying that, that that would rank that at the top of the worst national anthems of all time easily. And um, I could definitely buy that one. And then as far as Fergie goes, that's because of platform, because of how much viewership the NBA has, and mm -hmm. really one of the one of the most prominent, if not the first, social me. Uh, I mean, uh, national anthem blunders that made its way around social media in real time. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was uh, definitely not the best way for Major League Baseball to start the home run derby. Um, I feel like they've been, I feel, I feel like Major League Baseball, you know, for all the events that they do, for all the games and, you know, ceremonies that they have throughout the course of the season, they always find a way to shoot themselves in the foot at least once during the course of the season. And mm -hmm. uh, this is another instance of that. And when this happened, I just went, you've got to be kidding me. This is who you, this is who you, you have all these singers all around the country. And this, and this is the this one, is that the one you, they got picked. The one that, you, that, that got picked. And like I said, I had no idea who this woman was before the event started. And, and um, I will probably never forget her now, as long as I live um, for this performance. This, this was, it was bad. It was absolutely terrible. Bless her heart. I'm sure she's a good person and everything like that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, uh, it was sad to see. But it was sad and funny, I guess. Um, I mean, a lot of people were just laughing about about how bad this was. I mean, there was this horrible Joe comparison 
Um, obviously, a couple of days before, there was the assassination attempt on Trump, and people were saying, oh, first no. Trump's ear, and now all of our ears are taking a <laughs> Oh! So, yeah, that oh. was a pretty brutal comparison right there. That is brutal. That was all brutal. right. All right, well, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that was the home run derby on Monday night. Uh, that was... <laughs> Oh, boy. I think it's time to move on to Tuesday night. <laughs> All right, let's go. To, let's get to the All Star Game. So, um, the All Star Game, um, the American League once again defeated the National League for what seems like the thousandth time. The American League just continues to dominate this competition. Uh, this is the um, tenth win in the past eleven All Star Games, I believe, for yes. the American League, dating back to 2013. And um, the and they won every year but four since like 1997. Since, yeah, since, yeah, I mean, before 1990. So from 1997 to 2009, the American League, but with the exception of 2002, because that ended in a tie, That's um, the American League won, won every All-Star game. And then the National League went on a very rare three-game win streak from 2010 to 2012. And then the American League has just continued to dominate this competition from 2013 on. And honestly, from the pa- for the past, I mean, 11 seasons, this All-Star game has just kind of gotten more and more one-sided and ridiculous, honestly. You know, the National League used to dominate the All-Star game, you know, back in like the uh, in the old days, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. And there was a little more personal – it was a little more personal because at the time there was no interleague play. And, um, you know, the National League and the American League were more different than they are now. I mean, now they're basically the exact same league. There's TH around the entire league, and there's really no difference between either league anymore. But back in the old days, the, there were there was a lot more difference, and yeah. um, it was more personal. And the National League wanted to show, you know, as the older league, as the founding league of Major League Baseball, that they were superior, and they were going to prove it. And they used to uh, dominate the American League for years. Yeah especially when they had, you know, the, the teams like the Big Red Machine and the Pirates and all those teams that used to dominate back in those days. So now it's just turned into real – honestly, I the All-Star game for me, I, I'm ambivalent towards it now because it's just – it's always the American League coming out on top. And, I'm a, and you know, we're fans of an American League team. But now mm-hmm. – but now that there's really now it's completely an exhibition game and now and now that there's nothing really at stake anymore besides, you know, pride or bragging rights, I guess, at this point. I'm rooting for the National League now more than the American League. Like, can you at least show some fight here? Can we at least win a few of these games? Oh, like, I mean, it was to th- this game was a bit of a competitive game, although yeah. you can say that the you know, the three runs that the National League got came off the bat of one man, which was Shohei Otani with a three-run blast during the third inning, which the American League, to your credit with that argument, quickly answered back with three runs of their own. So, I mean, there was competitiveness. I did enjoy some of the fanfare around the game. Like, that, I liked what they tried to do with the Texas team, which, by the way, the first time, I think, in about 90 years that the defending World Series champion was the uh, host of the All-Star game. You have to go back ways, like, to the dominant times of the Yankees during, I think, the 19... The 30s. Uh, something like that. Something like that. Like, the 1930s or 40s where that happened. So, very rare feat uh, to be accomplished. And, I mean, I in, again, I enjoy the fanfare, but like you kind of said, you know, I know this World Series, you know, who has home field advantage in the World Series between 2003 and 2016. 16, yeah, 16. I, I know that's one of those things where you either liked it because it, it brought the all-star game meaning or you didn't like it and thought it was one of the worst stipulations in Major League Baseball. I didn't okay. like that stipulation. I thought that the team with the best record should have had the home field advantage, and that's right. the way it is now, so I'm glad that that's the case. Which, by the way, wasn't always the case like when it came to you know the best record hosting yeah having home field advantage in the world series because i think there was a time period i remembered it from the 90s that the it, it flipped back and forth yeah i mean they, that was the way that it was really leading up 
prior to the uh, to the 2003 All Star Game, what they did was they would alternate home field advantage between the American League uh, champion and the National League champion every year, and uh, that was a bit ridiculous and completely unfair. And teams who had far better records than the other teams, um, or far um, inferior records, I guess you can say, had home field advantage. And that came into play several times. I mean, that happened mm-hmm. in years like uh, 1987, where the Twins, who only won 85 games that year, defeated the Cardinals in seven games to win the championship. And they won all four games in Minnesota. The Twins were a terrible team on the road that year. They only won 29 games on the road. This is just an example of why, yeah. that, why that format didn't work or why that format wasn't fair. I'm just saying it's funny that it took us till 2017 to get it right. Yeah, it was, it was long overdue. So that was kind of ridiculous. But we'll talk about this game. So as you mentioned, Shohei Otani does Shohei Otani things. I actually had a feeling that he was going to hit a home run in this game. Um, So he hit a three-run bomb into the right center field stands um, to give the National League a 3 nothing lead. But the American League answered right back, courtesy of our good friend and fellow Yankee Juan Soto, who hit an RBI double that scored two. And then eventually, um, David Fry, um, I think he had a sack fly, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so. I think it was a sack fly that drove in Soto to tie the game up at three. Oh, no, he singled. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Fry, Fry singled and uh, Soto scored, and that tied the game at three. And then in the fifth inning, our one of our nemesis, um, and um, shout out to uh, Ben because he advocated for this guy for weeks um, and said it was an absolute travesty how he was not an all-star and everything like that. And uh, he showed that he knew what he was talking about because Jaron Duran, who eventually would garner the uh, MVP award, hit a two-run home run to give the American League the lead, and they never looked back. And so Jaron Duran won the 2024 Major League Baseball All-Star Game MVP award, like I mentioned. So congratulations, Ben. Um, You got your guy uh, won the award. And, um, yeah, and the American League continues to dominate the National League. I mean, the National League outhit the American League 10 to 5, and the American League still won this game. Yeah, I I mean, it's funny because I look back on, like, last year's All-Star rosters, and the National League completely had a better roster. Than the American League, and look at I look at it this year. You know, it's a little more even. I still leaned a little bit towards the National League, but the American League just had the better performances. As far as Jaron Duran goes, I think this goes back to something I told you, Ryan. I told Ben off camera in the last week or two. You know, I and I kind of uh, attributed that to something I heard. I think on MLB Network. It just goes to show, you know, that as much as Jaron Duran has the um you know has the talent and proved himself with an all-star game mvp performance it just goes to show because we how the uh all-star game starters are voted based on well popularity because it's a fan vote how much you know the fans of boston really dislike their ownership because they weren't as supportive as i think they were of some of their players in the past and you know, that's the thing. It just goes to show the disconnect between the fans and the ownership, even though the Red Sox are not too far behind the Yankees in terms of the wild card race and, and the division race, for that matter. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. And I mean, the Red Sox have uh, been playing their best baseball in years. It's the best baseball team that they've had in three seasons. And, um, you know, they've really taken off over the past month and their momentum even carried into the All-Star game itself. And uh, Jaron Duran, one of their guys, you know, wins the MVP award. I don't remember the last time. Oh, I think he was the first Red Sox to win the M- the also game MVP award since JD Drew won it in 2008. Yes, yes, absolutely. You nailed that one on the head. Yes, I, I just remembered that uh, because that that was the last uh, All Star game that happened at right. the Yankee Stadium. Red Sox winning the All Star yep. game MVP at Yankee. And, State. and that team was in the American League was also managed by Terry Francona, the Red Sox manager. So what a kick to the nuts that was as a Yankee fan. Uh, but it was still a good. That was still a good. That was still one of the classic All Star games, though. Um, that was still. I think one that's still my favorite All Star. Still game. the best All Star game that I've ever watched, though, by far. And, and the best home run derby with Josh Hamilton's run. Josh Hamilton nearly leaving Yankees, nearly hitting balls out of Yankee Stadium, reaching Mickey Mantle territory in the upper deck and the right field. Still miss that stadium to this day, man. I really do. I know, I, and it, and it took me like a decade to get to the new stadium just because of the pricing of it at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, 
But yeah, the American League wins this year's All Star All Star Game five to three. They continue to dominate over the National League. Um, the uh, starter for the National League was a little bit of history making piece as well. Paul Skeens. Um, he became the first. Uh, pitcher in history to be drafted one year and start the all-star game the next year um, as a rookie. And uh, Paul Skeens put on a show. He had, uh, he surpassed a hundred miles an hour several times um, during his, um, I don't know. I forget if he won one or two uh, innings in the all-star game. Um, I think, I think he, he went two. I think he won two score. He pitched two scoreless innings um, in the all-star game. And this is coming a week after he flirted with a no, no against the uh, Milwaukee Brewers. Um, last week on July 11th, he took a no a no hitter um, through uh, seven innings, I believe. He went through seven innings, oh six innings, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And um, he struck out 11 Brewers. And uh, Skeens has just taken the league by storm ever since he came up um, at the end of May. Um, the guy. It wasn't until this, I'm reading the uh, article off of uh, MLB.com from Alex Stumpf, and um, mm-hmm. Skeens was noticed. Skeens noticed that he had a chance um, at a no-hitter starting around the sixth or the seventh inning. This is according to Stumpf. Um, so, um, but obviously when you strike out 11 batters and you throw as hard as Skeens does, you're going to eventually uh, run out of room to um, to finish the job. And unfortunately, yeah. he had to um, get taken out of the game. Um and uh, he was done. Um, I'm trying to find how if it was six or seven or seven innings. I might, yeah. it might have been. I think it was six, if I'm not mistaken. But um, uh, I'll double check. But I could have sworn it was seven. It might have been actually. Um, I'm just trying to. Oh no, seven no hit innings. You're right. He, he he went seven innings, struck out eleven, and he had only one walk and one hit batter. So he was filthy that day. Mm-hmm. And, um, what, well, I want to know, Sam Ryan, what is your opinion on circles? Because it seems like more often now we're seeing guys pulled from no hit, you know, when they have a no hitter going. Do you think in a situation like we have with Paul Skeen, I don't know, actually, Paul Skeen's may be the right example because he is a little bit of a rookie. I think this one is a little more understandable, but, you know, just let's look at the situation itself, just doing a theoretical perspective. You know, if a guy is at, you know, a high pitch count, let's say he's maybe not 100, but let's say it's 85 to 90, seven innings, and, you know, two innings away, six outs away from a no-hitter. Do you, if this was a veteran pitcher, do you let him go? Oh, yeah. I let let him go. He's a veteran pitcher, and he's only at 85 to 90 pitches through uh, seven innings, which is what it was. Yeah, you let him go. Um, He's a veteran. He should know how to pitch in these kinds of situations. Um, pitch count wise, and I think the pitcher is smart enough to know what he's capable of um, for during the latter portion of the game. So, um, in those situations, I think it's a no-brainer. You let the veteran continue to go out there. This situation might be an exception. This situation, um, I would, yeah, I, I would give it a pass because um, Skeens was just mowing down everybody. Skeens is what 21, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and the guy throws 100 miles an hour with ease. And he's been in the league for barely two months, I think. And, um, you know, he is n- he's quickly becoming the new face of your franchise. He's the guy that you're going to try and build your future around. And, um, you know, he he's just dominating. But you don't want to you don't want to risk, you know, him blowing out his arm so soon. I mean, because we're already seeing that with, you know, pitches all over the league. You know, pitchers are more and more fragile, you know, nowadays. And um, you really – I don't think it's wise to try and push the envelope too far so soon. Um, you know, I know that the Pirates are nowhere near contention this year, but um, – That's why I was questioning a bit of like when you said build your fr- build the franchise around. I mean, yes, but at the same time, we've seen the Pirates do pirate things, and I'm wondering, is, just, is he just going to inevitably be traded at some point? Well, it depends on uh, how uh, the Pirates fare in the in the coming years. I mean, how, how many years? Uh, I mean, how many years again? Do you, does the club have team control over uh, their Plus six? Six. All right. Yeah. So you figure it's twenty twenty four. So he's not a, until the end of the decade. Basically. Until the end of the decade. So in this case scenario, you know, you figure, you know, by twenty thirty or something like that, depending on where the Pirates are, if they're still this me- this mediocrity 
um, that they've been in that, they, that they've been for so long, um, then I definitely think you see Skeens get dealt. But you know they have six years to build a contending team around him. Um, so. That's if Skeens holds up, he mm-hmm. he is a rookie. Yep. And so, and, uh, and, uh, and somebody pointed out something. I one of the inside pointed out on social media. You know, you kind of saw after the first inning, Judge and Soto, a bunch of these American League guys all gathering around and like taking notes and talking with one another. So, you know, eventually, uh, eventually, and that's what happens when new rookies come up into the league. You know, they can go hot for a time and eventually the hitters or if, if we're talking about the reciprocal, the pitchers will find start to find ways, you know, mm-hmm. and they will start to pinpoint weaknesses and stuff. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but I'm loving what we're seeing of skiing so far. Yeah, Skeens has uh, developed quite into a uh, into a phenomenon. Um, Skeens fever has definitely uh, taken over Pittsburgh, and it's definitely rampant around uh, Major League Baseball. I'd say everybody really is excited about him. I mean, guys who throw over 100 miles an hour nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of guys who throw 100 plus miles an hour now. It's not rare anymore in baseball. You're kind yeah. of almost required to hit at least 100. Well, uh, on that note, because you're talking about how pitchers are more fragile these days. And we talk about, I mentioned this on a previous episode of ETV sports with Nick Morgison, one of the shows I host here on the network, you know, the motion of some of these throws, you know, the fact that they reach a hundred miles an hour, which is so, so when it comes to, you know, humans and the, the way that they should use their arms, but we're talking about some of the pitching motions, like the curves and such, like, that's not really a typical, well, should be a typical human arm motion. But, you know, is my point is, you know, from a young age now, when we're at younger ages, we're putting pressure on pitchers to expand their repertoire, hit 70, 80 miles an hour. We're talking like teenagers that are in high school. Like, is that part of the problem of when we're talking about the development of pitchers and why they're more fragile these days? I think it definitely plays a role. I think, I think, I think it definitely plays a role. I think more high school. I think I saw an article um, that more high school pitchers are getting Tommy John surgery now than ever before. I mean, there a lot of high school pitchers now. You know, they're reaching like the high 80s, low 90s. So they're already, you know, getting themselves up there in terms of velocity and um, and accuracy in their pitching motions. So you know, they're being taught at an early age. You know, you know, velocity is key and Unfortunately, it's going to it's gonna take a toll on their body, on their arms. Um, I think high school is just way too young to be undergoing Tommy John surgery. I, yeah. I, I really do. Because your body's not completely developed yet at that point. No. And it's just not a healthy situation. I really wish MLB or I really wish coaching staffs would ease up on this on um, stressing how important um, you know velocity is when it comes to pitching. Don't get me wrong, velocity is important, but uh, I mean, continue I'll let the to, kid throw. Yeah, I'll just let the kid throw. I mean, you know, I I mentioned this with Nick in an episode during spring training when all those pitchers were going down with arm injuries. Um, when we were guys like Garrett Cole went down and Justin Verlander went down. And um, I know there were a couple of other pitchers that we covered during spring training who went down with arm injuries. You know, we were mentioning, you know, it's an, it's unfathomable how many pitchers are going down nowadays and how quickly they go down. Spencer Strider, I just remembered we talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, we were just talking about it and we were thinking to myself, you know, we never saw this amount of pitching injuries during the 2000s, you know, when we were growing up. And, um, you know, the 2000s, you know, obviously didn't have as many guys throwing 100 miles an hour. But, you know, I mean, a lot of these guys were more durable and they learned to be creative and they weren't afraid to let the uh, hitters put the ball in play as much. You know, they trusted their fielders more and, you know, they were efficient. And, you know, I wish Major League Baseball would kind of go back to that style of play. You know, I, I really don't like how many, t- sure. how many times t- a team strikes out during a game. I mean, we're looking at teams strike out 10 to 15, on average 10 to 15 times, I think, during a game. It's just too many strikeouts. It's, it might be enter- – sure, it could be entertaining for the home, ta- for the home team crowd um, if, you're, it's, if it's your guy who's just mowing down a lineup and making them look like fools. But at the same time, you know, there's going to be um, – there's going to be repercussions, you know, down the road eventually. And we're seeing that more and more. Some guys are just going on, guys are just going under the knives much more frequently. And uh, it's not good. It's not good for the game, in my opinion. I really think they got to ease up on this. 
But but to Paul Skeen's credit, he is taken he has taken Bleak by storm. Yeah, he's doing phenomenal things, and I, I, I don't know. It, it, I'm already hearing comparisons. People are already trying to compare Paul Skeen's and Livy Dune to uh, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey in the end. Okay, completely different sports, and no, they're not the same power couple. <laughs> Taylor, Swift, Taylor Swift is one of the richest human beings in the world. So let's just ease up on it. Let's just ease up on let's just ease up on those comparisons. Yeah, same that same thoughts here. Yeah. But yes, yeah, Skeens is a great pitcher, and I really hope that he stays healthy for the foreseeable future. And I hope and I wish him nothing but the best. I think that he could have a very great career moving forward. But I always take these, you know, these guys always at the beginning with a little grain of salt. Like, let's just see how it plays out. He's only been in the league for two months. But it's an honor, but it's amazing what he's uh, accomplished in these two short months and, uh, you know, that he was able to start the All-Star game just two months after making his debut. That does not happen, but he earned it yeah. with the way he's pitched. He's been mm-hmm. phenomenal. And his ERA is down to 1.29, I believe, right now. Yep. So, however, I do think eventually the league is going to start to uh, figure him out a little bit. I do expect him to hit some uh, to hit the wall at some point um, during the season. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was pretty cool nonetheless to see uh, Skeen start the uh, the All Star game, and uh, yeah, if uh, maybe uh, Livy Dunn is his good luck charm, <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah. All right, well, uh, let's go to our next topic, which is Major League Baseball uh, said that they are looking to begin robot umpire testing. Um, during next year's spring training in 2025, and this could be used during the regular season as soon as 2026. And we both talked about this prior to the start of this show. Um, we're not necessarily the biggest fans of this. Um, we prefer if we, if major league, look, major league baseball, no doubt has a problem with umpires calling balls and strikes. It's getting worse and worse every year um, the strike zone is just all over the place for a lot of these umpires. It's either too wide or too small. It's mostly too wide. A lot of umpires just call pitches well off the strike zone nowadays. Um, so, but when it comes to robot umpires, we're not necessarily a fan of it. We prefer this be done in the way that the minor league uh, does. Yeah. It. So to clarify, because I know there might be a little confusion with robot umpires. There's two systems that are going on and two systems that have been talked about and have been tested over the course of the last couple of years. One, when we talk about robot umpire is an automatic ball and strike zone where basically there is a defined strike zone. Uh, I'm not sure how this would go, you know, when we're talking about an Aaron judge versus somebody of a smaller stature, like a Jose Altuve, you know, with their, with their batting. So that's something that should be figured out, but there is a defined strike zone. Let's say I was always taught the strike zone was chest to knees. So let's define it as that. And any pitch that hits that zone is going to be called a strike. And any pitch that doesn't hit that zone is going to be called the ball. Um, the other thing, which is, I think the direction you were going with, Ryan is talking about something that's being tested in AAA right now, the challenge system where uh, the umpire is behind the plate as normal, calling the balls and strikes. And at some point, if the catcher or the hitter disagree with a call, immediately tap to the head, tap to the helmet. And then I think it only takes about like three to five seconds and they get a, a call with the challenge system. Now, what I had heard was maybe the challenge system might be something like, you know, if you get one challenge wrong, one goes away. And it's basically like three strikes and you're out like a typical baseball game. But if you keep getting them right, then you keep getting the challenges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like that more. I mean, I don't know. So if so, say the count is like, um, say it's a, it's a new count. Say it's like zero, z- no balls, no strikes, and a and a hitter um, disagrees with a pitch that was called um, a strike. Um, but when they but they felt it was a ball, so um, they tap their helmets. And I'm act- this is actually a question I wanted to ask you. And they they tap mm-hmm. their helmets. And they want to review that. So say they lose that challenge. So does that they're, that means they're automatically out, even though only one pitch was thrown? Uh no. They still have they still have two more challenges. Oh, okay. So they okay, gotcha. I know. I think it's every time they don't get a challenge right, they lose the challenge, and they have up to three. So, but if they keep getting them right, they oh, keep so they, you have up to three challenges for balls and strikes throughout the game. 
uh on, let me let me double check but basically when we're talking about what the robot umpire is the automatic ball and strike system and rob manfred basically said oh here we have made material progress i think that this technology is good to a hundredth of an inch the technology in terms of the path of the ball is blue perfect and there is they did note here this is a article from fox sports there is little desire to call the strike zone as the cube defined in the rule book. And MLB has experimented with modifications during minor league testing. So, you know, like we talk about, I don't know, and you kind of uh, talked about that. I don't know if a well defined strike zone with an automatic balls and strike system, an ABS or robot umpire, if you want to call it that, is the direction to go. I think the challenge system works better. Yeah, I do too. And I mean, if they did a robotic umpire, I mean, just the sight of seeing this, uh, whatever it is, would anything but be behind the catcher if they decided to do this uh, robotic umpire thing? I I don't know. I don't know what that would realistically look like in an MLB setting. Because if that's the case, uh, look, as much as umpires give fans a headache, trust me, I know. Um, I just, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to see a baseball game <laughs> With just a pitcher, the catcher, and the hitter, and uh, nothing behind, it would just look so weird. It would just look yeah, so- no. I, uh, I I mean, if they do use the Hawkeye technology for that uh, challenge system, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to see here. They use the Hawkeye technology, but seem to get no sort of clarity as to what is going to be the rules for this ball strike challenge system. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, the whole thing is just, the whole thing sounds kind of eluding and um, it's, I understand major league baseball is trying to do something about this. I mean, fans have just been complaining about umpires for years now. Umpires have taken a beating um, from both fans players, coaches, and teams. Sometimes it's deserving. Sometimes it's not. So, you know, I'm just, you know, I, but I also, you know, regardless of what you think of umpires, they are an integral part of the game. Sure. You don't want to see them implement themselves too much in the game, but I mean, it's what baseball has always been for all these years. So to an extent, I still want to keep the human element of the umpire in the game. Okay, so I was right. Each team gets three challenges per game with successful challenges retained for future use in the game. So if a team, let's say the first challenge, uh, they get right. They're still at three. The second challenge, they get wrong. They're down to two. Third, ch- the next challenge, they get right. They're still at two. You know, it's a matter of being penalized for when you get it wrong, not when yeah. you get it right. All right, yeah. I mean, I could probably get behind that. I could probably yeah. get behind that. Like, I, I'm like you in that, you know, I always try to defend the human element of the game. At the same time, we have seen some really ridiculous calls. Maybe not so much in the ball strike department. I mean, some in there, but all more so in the field that it's like, you know, it's making it hard to defend umpires sometimes. Yeah. Like there's the amount of ridiculousness, like the Aaron Boone, and then I think it was the manager in Detroit, Hinch, that basically getting thrown out for things that fans have said that I'm like, you know, that MLB umpires make it really, you know, they make it really hard to defend them sometimes. And, you know, unfortunately, when you have an umpire union that's even stronger than your player union, which is already ridiculously strong, it, it feels kind of powerless for you to do anything. Yeah, it really does. And, um, but regardless, Major League Baseball, it needs to do something about this. I mean, like we, like we mentioned, my umpires nowadays, I feel like are just having a tougher time calling balls and strikes. I also think that there should kind of be an age limit too when it comes to umpiring. I mean, because not only are you, you know, not only does your eyesight worsen as you get older and it can be difficult to call balls and strikes. But I'm try- also- sorry that I'm laughing. It's just, I'm thinking, you know, they have said that about they say that about driving that there should be an age limit on driving too and nobody puts a stop to that there should be an age limit for for certain things in life but also not only because of that but also because i don't want to see like a 60 to 65 year old man get concussed by a by 100 mile an hour foul ball yeah that too like yeah that's not that's not good so i mean i really think for the sake of um 
uh, for the safety and the well-being of the uh, um, for of the human pe- beings of umpires. There's still very there's still most umpires in Major League Baseball are good. Most of them are good. They're up there for a reason. They're among the best umpires in the country. They're there for a reason. But there are just a select few that still stink. And um, I think definitely having some help with for these guys, having some assistance in some way, shape or form. I definitely think that would only be beneficial to both them and to uh, the league itself. So with that being said, I prefer the challenge system that in the minor leagues rather than completely replacing these guys and taking them out of a job, essentially, I think. So, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's the way that we feel about this. And uh, so that's one thing that Major League Baseball has uh, been talking about. There's another thing that Rob Manfred has been talking about. Rob Manfred um, – is apparently open to the idea of Major League Baseball players at the uh, Olympics in, uh, was it 2026 or 2028? 2028. 2028. 2028. 2028. Um, Major Baseball um, has not been at the Olympics since, uh, what, the 1990s, I think? Well, they stopped after, I think, 04, but they did have the one-off in 2020 or 2021, that COVID-era Olympics mm-hmm. in Tokyo. Okay, I just want to say for the record, I would not want to see Major League Baseball players at the Olympics. They already are on the road enough um, for their own team around the league. So, um, And I think that there are just so many players around the league who are just too important to, the determining, to determining whether or not a team is either a pretender or a contender. Say, for instance, you take Aaron Judge off the Yankees and he goes to play in the Olympics. That the Yankees just become a significantly different team. Okay, so here's the thing. I want to say that I want love the idea because I mean I know people moan and gripe about the World Baseball Classic, but the reason that was developed was because baseball did get kicked out of the Olympics. And yeah, as far as I know, you know, you had that in the Olympics, but I mean I don't know if there still is, but there was once a point where I think power walking was an Olympic sport, which just goes to show you what the IOC is like, you know, trying to take out, uh, taking out baseball, trying to take out like wrestling and boxing and eliminating all the traditional sports in favor of, I don't know, something like a power walk is just ridiculous at the, uh, but you know, so when I, people moan and complain about the WBC, I'm like, well, you can't put that all on major league baseball because the IOC basically went, okay, screw you. Um, But at the same time, I don't think like if you were kind of going, this is the argument you were going to, I don't think general managers and owners are going to allow such a thing to happen because of how vital that some of these guys are to their teams. And also from the standpoint of, well, if you have, I mean, just look what, look at all that happened with national hockey league and how long it took them to get back to the Olympics because Every three years, they, they every four years, pardon me, they had to like not have an all star weekend because that would be they would have a two or three week break in the regular season for their players to participate in the Olympics. Which means, in terms of baseball, you're not going to get a 162 game season, so the owners aren't going to go for that. Yeah, like you talk about with how some players how vital they are to their team, so the general managers aren't going to go for that, but. I think the players would go for it because of what you saw in the last uh, World Baseball Classic in 2023 and uh, how people, how players saw it as an honor to represent a country and how some people, you know, namely two people in Los Angeles, one of whom, you know, was on one side and just went to the other, (laughs) Trout and Otani, (laughs) that's basically the only chance that they're going to have to sniff a team honor, a championship, basically, because you know, their teams don't do enough. And and this was something that Nick and others here at the network had basically talked about. And we were talking about it, you know, the fact that some of them view the World Baseball Classic as, you know, more significant than winning a World Series was just kind of sad and kind of emblematic of problems that are going on in Major League Baseball. So it, it just wasn't a look, good look. So I wish they could represent the Olympics, but I, I know for certain, uh, general managers and owners aren't going to go for it, and it is going to be a struggle. Yeah, you make a lot of good points there. Um, you basically hit it all on the head, basically. And um, if it, if it didn't interfere with the regular season, I would be more for it. But the fact that it would, um, I mean, with the WBC, 
at least it would take place before the regular season started. It took it takes place during a spring training. But even still, you know, I always, you know, tense up whenever these guys leave to go play in the WBC because you just hope that they stay healthy and you don't want anything bad to happen. But then again, they could also get hurt during spring training as well. So, right. so uh, there's really not too much of a difference. And then when would you do it? Like, let's say you, you did it in November and December. Like, now you have logistical issues. You have players who are going to want to rest and you're going to have to, you know, the United States ain't going to be a place where you play baseball during the during the December or I mean, January. unless you stay in Florida and Texas and those kinds of places. That yeah, which unless where they played when they, but just where they typically play them. I mean, they don't typically play WBC games in the Northeast or the Midwest. They typically play them in warmer climates. So I mean, I don't know if that would. And then, and, and then you'll have the winter leagues complaining. What the hell? What about us? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because they do play winter leagues in the Dominican Republic and uh, other tropical places as well. Even the Arizona Fall League. Yeah, I mean, baseball, you know, even you know, though it dominates in the summer, summer baseball, 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 baseball is year-round around, basically around the world. There's always, a, there's always a baseball game happening somewhere around the world. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's it's just the way it is. And, you know, you've, you've made a lot of good points there. And well, All I can say is, just to wrap, put a bow on it from my standpoint, that I appreciate your compliments. You know, this plus all the money that's being made by players and, you know, considering what the Dodgers did in terms of holding off on, I mean, deferring money on contracts significantly, you know, plus, I mean, Nick Morgus and I talked about the bad blood between the owners and the players union and even sometimes the players in their own union combined with whatever the hell is going on with, this Wander Franco situation, which at as of the time we're recording is, you know, if Franco is going the direction that he's going to and the race can't get out of that contract, oh, um, all these elements combined, oh man, I, if you thought 2022 was bad, whenever this next negotiation is, it's going to get bad. Really. Yeah, we both talked about uh, a little bit, talked about it a little bit before the start of the show that we both kind of see a lockout in the future. Um, after this collective bargaining agreement comes to an end, which is unfortunate, obviously. We don't want that to happen, obviously, but I think it's inevitable, really. I just think that, and this one might be even worse than uh, the 2022 lockout. This might go, this might stretch into the regular season, um, depending on, because there are some glaring issues surrounding the league, and uh, this is definitely one of them. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, before we end the show, we just uh, want to quickly talk about some potential second half uh, headlines that we think can happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I think so. Obviously, with a trade deadline approaching, um, teams are going to be shaken up um, within a couple of weeks. And um, I think teams that are really going and among the teams that I think are really going to benefit from the trade deadline. Um, I definitely think the Orioles are going to be one of the strongest teams after the deadline is over. I agree. Um, I have, you know, um, Ben and I have talked about how we could see Garrett Crochet going to the Orioles. That's what I think. That's where I think he is going to end up. The Orioles need another arm in that rotation. And Crochet is the biggest uh, pitcher available um, for a trade. So I definitely see that happening. So I think the, when it comes to the second half headlines, I think the Orioles are going to be one of the strongest teams coming out of it. Um, you know, even though we're Yankee fans, I think the Orioles are probably going to win the American League East again this year. I, Even though the Yankees are not far behind them, they're only a game and a half back, I believe, uh, something like yeah. that. But um, I just think that the Orioles are the younger team. I still think they're hungry. I, th I think they're more athletic. So uh, I think <laughs> they're prob I think they're going to win the AL East. Um, Second half, I also think that the Astros are going to pass the Mariners. The Mariners let the Astros back into yeah. the mix, and the Mariners have just not been good for a while now. Their offense has, was, has been very flawed. And the well, Astros. You, you also have to remember the Astros had a lot of injuries on the pitching front for the first half mm -hmm. of the season. Now they're getting those guys back. So it's just. Ronald, Ronald Blanco's been their savior. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the stuff that we're saying, like, and it's not just about the Yankees, but like you're seeing teams in the first half 
what is it? They, what is it? The expression about the mean, you know, the everything averaging out because, you know, you saw the Yankees dominating on the Orioles have gone back on their tail. You saw the Mariners dominating the West and now the Astros have gone back on their tail. You saw the Dodgers, you know, all the hype that they had during the start of the season. And as of late, they've just been as bad as the Yankees. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a little hyperbole, but at the same time, you know, they have fallen off a little bit the last month. Yeah. They've been really bad. And, and all the all the money we just talked about all the money that they invested in these guys and Yamamoto's hurt, May's hurt, Otani obviously isn't even playing uh, as a pitcher. He's only going to be a DH this season. This is not good. No, not at all. But um, well, I'm also curious to see if the Cardinals can make a run towards the playoffs in the second half. Um, they've been playing some pretty good baseball, and um, I mean they're coming off a very disappointing 2023, obviously with the rare last place losing season. But mm-hmm. it looks like the Cardinals are starting to crawl back into respectability. Um, I don't know if they'll catch the Brewers in the uh, standings for the division, but I think they could. I think they could lock up a wild card spot. For and sure. The, we're um, also curious to see if the Grimace Mets are for real or not. <laughs> the Grimace Mets, are for, and, and it's and it said that uh, Ben isn't here because then I would throw the question to him. But since he's not here, I guess it's us. Um, what did they? And ESPN talked about it during the Yankee Red Sox ESPN telecast. What do you do if you're the Red Sox? Are you a buyer at this point? Are you? I think you, you have to be. Good? I think you have to be. Why not? You weren't. If you came into the season with no expectations, why not try and make a few moves at the deadline? I mean, if it works, great. But if not, all right. You know, just at least try to do something. I mean, you know, they have they have a lot of promising young talent on that team. Um, obviously, you want to try and preserve that talent for your future, so you don't want to give up too much. But at the same time. I think you came this far, you know, you were, you were very poor during the first month and a half of the regular season and you started to take off. And now you've been one of the hottest teams in baseball over the past month. I think you got to take advantage of the way that you're playing and try and uh, add to your team. As much as I hate to say it, you're a threat now. So Mm -hmm. try and make some moves. Uh, As far as MVP races go, I mean, the national league, like I mentioned, it's it, there's obviously Otani, but for some reason, just considering he plays the field and considering he's been hitting just as well, if not better, even though he was out for a time, you know, I'm leaning more towards Bryce Harper than I am Otani. And on the AL front, I'm letting my biases go here and I'm saying Judge. Judge has been great. It's mm-hmm. been really, really great. I mean, I don't know what else you can say. I mean, I don't know if he'll win the triple crown. I know that he's, you know, I know he's got a legitimate shot at it, but, you know, Stephen Kwan has just had a phenomenal season for uh, Cleveland this year. Oh, Stephen Kwan's ridiculous. I don't know if he's going to get to the 400 mark, but he's going he, to. He won't hit 400, but he's going to, he'll, I think he'll hit like three, I think he'll finish the season hitting 340 or 350 something, honestly. Yeah. That's damn good. But uh, we'll see how the second half plays out, but we're out of time here. Um, so yeah, the, uh, second half of the baseball season resumes tomorrow on the day that this, this, that this episode will air, uh, which is Friday, July 19th. And, uh, we'll see how it shapes up. Tom, thank you so much for joining me for this week's episode. Thank it was you a for pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And, uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone.